result of the EU referendum. Last week saw one of the biggest democratic exercises in our history, with over 33 million people from England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and Gibraltar all having their say. We should be proud of our parliamentary democracy, but it is right when we consider questions of this magnitude, we don't just leave it to politicians, but rather listen directly to the people. And that is why members from across this House voted for a referendum by a margin of almost six to one. And while I talk about this House, let me welcome the new member for Tooting to her place. I think I'd advise her to keep her mobile phone on. She might be in the shadow cabinet by the end of the day. and the next steps at tomorrow's European Council. Mr Speaker, the British people have voted to leave the European Union. It was not the result I wanted, nor the outcome that I believe is best for the country I love. But there can be no doubt about the result. Of course, I don't take back what I said about the risks. It is going to be difficult. We've already seen that there are going to be adjustments within our economy, complex constitutional issues, and challenging new negotiation to undertake with Europe. But I am clear, and the Cabinet agreed this morning, that the decision must be accepted and the process of implementing the decision in the best possible way must now begin. At the same time, Mr Speaker, we have a fundamental responsibility to bring our country together. In the past few days, we've seen despicable graffiti daubed on a Polish community centre. We've seen... The British people have spoken and they have voted to leave the European Union. And whatever our personal views, we should now all respect the democratic will of the British people and work together and move on. I know there is surprise, shock and lots of emotion on both sides of the channel. And there will be many attempts to replay both the referendum campaign and history. Only in the last few days I have heard people say, what if British politicians had been more honest with the British people about the political dimension of the EU and the dream of the United States of Europe? What if the EU had offered more in negotiations with the British people? But that is all now in the past. Now politicians in the UK and the EU both need to look to the future. And both sides of the channel, we need to pause and start thinking about our negotiating strategies. Let us think carefully in the short term about the best relationship for us both in the long term. As the presidency said, cool heads must prevail. Across Europe, there is disagreement amongst leaders about what the EU should be seeking in its future relationships with the UK. Some are saying, let's go slowly. Others are saying, let's punish Britain. Others are saying, oh, we have a plan. We have an association agreement ready. And just in the, as, as, as in the EU, EU, there are differences. There are differences in the UK. When to treggle Article 50, whether to look for an EU-UK trade deal, whether to look for an EEA deal, or some other scenario. The EU needs to be clear, and the EUK needs to prepare its own plan. And in the, in the meantime, the treaties are clear and they must be respected. So both the UK and the EU negotiators need to give the market certainty over the timetable for negotiations. Prepare your negotiating positions ready for when Article 50 is triggered. And look for a deal that is as much as possible mutually beneficial to both the EU and the UK. It is not the speed at which negotiations are completed, but the deal that we get at the end which is more important. Let me also say on a personal note, for centuries, Britain has welcomed, Brit for centuries, Britain has welcomed people from all over the world. When many European countries were mired in dictatorship and fascism, we are an open country. And today, I hope all British politicians can unite and state in that Britain will remain an open, tolerant and global nation. Regardless of how we now proceed, Britain and the EU will continue to be close partners for years to come. So now is not the time to replay the past. Now is the time to look to the future, to ensure that as we roll up our sleeves and begin negotiations, we in Britain become good neighbours and are no longer reluctant tenants. I am not going to give a long speech. 
uh, because what I really want to do is have a conversation with some outstanding young people uh, who are part of our panel, and we're going to introduce in a moment. Uh, but I do want to begin by offering some opening thoughts uh, about the time in which we gather here today. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, the British people's decision to leave the European Union, uh, the vote that took place yes yesterday. Um, just a few, uh, few hours ago, I spoke with Prime Minister David Cameron. Uh, David has been an outstanding uh, friend and partner on the global stage. And based on our conversation, I'm confident that the UK is committed to an orderly transition out of the EU. We agreed that our economic and financial teams will remain in close contact as we stay focused on ensuring economic growth and financial stability. Uh, I then spoke to Chancellor Merkel of Germany, and we agreed that the United States and our European allies will work closely together in the weeks and months ahead. I do think that yesterday's vote speaks to the ongoing changes and challenges that are raised by globalization. But while the UK's relationship with the EU will change, uh, one thing that will not change is the special relationship that exists between our two nations. Uh, that will endure. The EU will remain one of our indispensable partners. Our NATO alliance will remain a cornerstone of global security. And in a few weeks, we'll be meeting in Warsaw for uh, the NATO summit. And our shared values, including our commitment to democracy and pluralism and opportunity for all people in a globalized world. That will continue to unite all of us. And that is the work that brings us here today. The world has shrunk. It is interconnected. All of you represent that interconnection. Many of you are catalyzing it and accelerating it. I'm uh, delighted to welcome Secretary Kerry to London today. His visit here just three days after the referendum result underlines the strength of the special relationship and indeed Britain's many friendships around the world. And I very much appreciate you taking the time to visit with us today. The result uh, last Friday is, of course, not the result that I wished for, and it means a difficult period ahead for our country as we adjust to the choice that has been made, and over a longer period, our economy adjusts to the new realities. But the people of Britain have spoken, and the government is clear that the result must be respected and will be delivered. As the Prime Minister set out earlier this afternoon, Britain's global role remains undiminished. There is absolutely no question that Britain will turn its back on the world, or indeed on Europe. Britain is, and always will be, open for business, committed to peace and security, and a leading supporter of the international rules-based system. We are a permanent member of the UN Security Council, the second largest contributor to NATO, a member of the G7, the G20, and the Commonwealth. And even outside the EU, we will seek to continue close collaboration and the strongest possible economic relationship with the 27. I want to stress again that until an Article 50 notice is served, Britain remains a full member of the European Union we will continue to engage with it and to contribute to it. Our support for Operation Sophia, the EU task force <coughs> tackling people traffickers in the Mediterranean, is just one example of how we will continue to play our part. I expect that cooperation will go on, regardless of our future status and relationship with the European Union. I also want to reassure EU nationals living in the UK that there will be no Mr. President, thank you very much, honorable members, members of the college. The 23rd of June 2016 will go down in history as a day that shook the United Kingdom and the European Union. A majority of the British voters have expressed their wish to leave the EU. Following this result, which we respect, there is deep, deep regret. But there is also a strong resolve to show unity in our response. 
However, let me underscore the fact that today I represent the full Council, all 28 members of it. Until a UK exit is finalised, the UK will be a member of the Council with all the rights and obligations that derive from this. Now, the United Kingdom has been a respected member of the European Union since 1973, working with member states and institutions to build and strengthen a secure and prosperous Europe. The outcome of the referendum therefore marks a watershed moment in Europe's history. But history and geography cannot be changed. The UK is and will always be a European nation. We share the same values, we harbour the same hopes and will continue to work together as partners and allies. In other, in other words, it will be in the interest of us all to ensure that a future relationship will be constructive and mutually beneficial. Now let me be absolutely clear. No one, no one will benefit from a prolonged period of political limbo. The ball is in the British court, and we do look forward to hearing from London soon. At the same time, let us also allow the UK the time it needs to re recuperate and to take the necessary decisions so we can indeed move forward. In other words, cool heads must now prevail. Mr. President, since its creation in 1957, the EU has gone a long and successful way. It has reunited Eastern and Western Europe and it has brought about the longest period of peace on our continent in modern times. It has been a driving force to bring and keep the people of Europe together in all its diversity and strength. Never in modern history have we enjoyed so much freedom, so much wealth and so much stability in Europe. Now why did people give their life in Ukraine carrying a blue banner with golden stars? Why do people from Africa and Asia leave their families in rickety boats to reach our shores? It is because of the fundamental values that bind us, the fundamental freedoms that inspire us, and the promise that if you do your best, you really can get ahead, and if you cannot, you won't be cast away. Now these achievements stand, and we can be proud to have contributed to them. However, nothing is irreversible, nothing inevitable. The shock of the referendum should be a wake-up call to us all. Whether we like it or not, the sentiments of a large part of the British voters are shared in many other EU member states. So we will have to do better. We must intensify our efforts. We do need a more efficient, more effective and most of all a more convincing European Union. Now clearly, in this globalized world, Europe is facing huge challenges. So yes, we do need an EU that is protecting its borders and controlling migration. An EU that is providing economic, economic opportunities to all citizens. An EU that is keeping threats at bay. We need an EU that is not seen as a threat to national identity, but as an extension of our identities. An EU that is not seen as a bureaucratic meddler, but as a facilitator. Now, the inconvenient truth is that neither Europe as a whole nor any single nation can isolate itself from a world in turmoil. And we must cope with this turmoil together as best as we can, or else the zone of peace and stability that we have built up over decades might disintegrate. And we would have no one to blame but ourselves. Mr. President, we need unity because geopolitical tension and the conflict surrounding Europe will continue and possibly even multiply. We need unity because terrorists will not hesitate to strike at us again. We need unity to control the huge flows of migrants that will continue to move forward, uh, to move towards this continent. And let me be clear once more. No country on the face of the earth can meet these challenges alone. These challenges are simply too complex. They also tend to ignore borders. And true, 
Part of the challenge lies in the domestic realm, convincing European citizens that unity remains the best choice. But fancy words, conclusions and declarations will not be enough. We have to act. The fact that fragmentation is no longer considered unthinkable should gravely concern us all and propel us into action. There is no reason to be fatalistic, for together we are still strong. Together we are the world's strongest advocates for the values we cherish, rule of law, freedom, democracy, a market-based economy. But it would be foolish to underestimate the challenge at hand. <clears throat> Mr. President, the outcome of the referendum has left us with an unprecedented situation. Many within the UK and other member states feel uncertain about the consequences. It is in the interest of all to have clarity about the way ahead soon. At the same time, it is important to recall that we have the rules to deal with this situation in an orderly way. As we all know, Article 50 of the Treaty sets out a procedure to be followed if a member state decides uh, to leave the European Union. Now, the EU stands ready to launch negotiations swiftly, but it's up to the UK government and no one else to trigger Article 50. And negotiations can only start after such a notification has taken place. Meanwhile, we have some work to do. Clearly, the outcome of the UK referendum does not mean that the threats and challenges we commonly face have suddenly disappeared. Neither does it mean that each nation will be better off acting on its own rather than part as a collective. On the contrary, I would say. Now, if the UK, if the UK decides to leave indeed, the union of 27 member states will continue. Together we can and will address our common challenge to generate growth, to increase prosperity, and to ensure a safe and secure environment for our citizens. This is what European citizens expect from us, and rightfully so. Now, while institutional debates on treaty changes and conventions are a paradise to lawyers and diplomats, they are a hell for citizens. So we simply need to grit our teeth, roll up our sleeves, and use all the tools and means we have. And true, it will not always be easy to agree on what we should do. It is no doubt challenging to make cooperation work, but we have to forge ahead. For the failure to do so stands equal to jeopardizing prosperity and well-being, and that, Mr. President, would be reckless. In closing, the European Council will meet in a few hours. You will understand that I cannot prejudge the discussions in the Council. In other words, I cannot go into greater detail on the next steps. However, I will listen carefully to your debate. You yourself, President Schultz, will be able to address the members of the Council this afternoon when you meet them and to convey the substance of the debate and of the resolution you will adopt later this morning. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. Funny, isn't it? Funny, isn't it? Thank Apparat you very much for that Apparat very warm Apparat welcome. Apparat um, how things have Apparat changed. Eine Sekunde bitte. Sekunde bitte. Kolleginnen und Kollegen, eine große Qualität der Demokratie ist, dass man auch denen zuhört, deren Meinung man nicht teilt. Well, thank you, Mr. Schultz. Isn't it funny? You know, when I came here 17 years ago and I said that I wanted to lead a campaign to get Britain to leave the European Union, you all laughed at me. Well, I have to say, you're not laughing now, are you? And the reason you're so upset, the reason you're so angry, has been perfectly clear from all the angry exchanges this morning. You, as a political project, are in denial. You're in denial that your currency is failing. You're in denial... Well, just, well, just look at the Mediterranean. No, no, no. As a, as a policy to impose poverty on Greece and the rest of the Mediterranean, you've done very well.
and you're in denial over Mrs. Merkel, Mrs. Merkel's call last year for as many, many people as possible to cross the Mediterranean into the European Union has led to massive divisions between countries and within countries. But the biggest problem you've got and the reason, the main reason the United Kingdom voted the way that it did is you have, by stealth, by deception, without ever telling the truth to the British or the rest of the peoples of Europe, you have imposed upon them a political union. You've imposed upon them a political union. And when the people in 2005 in the Netherlands and France voted against that political union, when they rejected the Constitution, you simply ignored them and brought the Lisbon Treaty in through the back door. What happened? What happened last Thursday was a remarkable result. It was indeed a seismic result, not just for British politics, for European politics, but perhaps even for global politics too. Because what the little people did, what the ordinary people did, what the people who, who have been oppressed over the last few years and seen their living standards go down, they rejected the multinationals. They rejected the merchant banks. They rejected big politics. And they said, actually, we want our country back. We want our fishing waters back. We want our borders back. We want to be an independent, self-governing, normal nation. And that is what we have done. And that is what must happen. And in doing so, and in doing so, we now offer a beacon of hope to Democrats across the rest of the European continent. I'll make one prediction this morning. The United Kingdom will not be the last member state to leave the European Union. So the question, the question is, what do we do next? Now, it is up to the British government to invoke Article 50. And I have to say that I don't think we should spend too long in doing it. I totally agree. Uh, Mr Juncker, that the British people have voted, we need to make sure that it happens. But what I would like to see is a grown-up and sensible attitude to how we negotiate a different relationship. Now, now I, know, I know that virtually none of you have ever done a proper job in your lives <laughs> or worked or worked in business, or worked in trade, or indeed ever created a job. But listen, just listen. Briefly in the conversation that we've already had, and we will talk further about the issues that Philip referred to. But we reaffirm that our two countries are strong and <coughs> vigilant NATO partners, permanent members of the UN Security Council, commercial partners, global champions of democracy and the rule of law. And the United States counts on strong UK leadership in NATO, the G7, the UN Security Council, the Counter-National Coalition, and we are both looking forward to the NATO summit next month as 28 nations, including 22 EU members, come together in Warsaw to take the next steps to further strengthen the world's greatest alliance. And we will continue to be partners in that alliance. This morning in Brussels, and Philip referred to our relationship with the EU, I reaffirmed the centrality of US-EU relations and the common agenda that we share. This includes the promotion of peace in Syria, the defeat of Daesh, Support for Afghanistan in its fight against extremists. Support for the government of national war in Libya. Support for a sovereign and democratic Ukraine. Just to mention a few of the global challenges that bring us together constantly. It includes addressing the global refugee crisis, implementing both climate change agreement approved in Paris and the joint comprehensive plan of action with Iran to reduce the threat posed by a nuclear weapon. It includes our international health efforts, where together we helped stop the spread of Ebola and now stand on the threshold of the first generation born free from AIDS. 
And it includes our effort to revolutionize the way that we produce energy, crack down on corruption, create jobs, and spur growth on both sides of the Atlantic. And while last Thursday's outcome was, as Philip said, different from what he hoped for, it was different from what both our governments looked for. It reflected, however, the will of the British people. And we respect that, all of us. That is the essence of democracy. Really, so too, my friends, is leadership. And we have immense confidence in the quality of leadership on both sides. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, apologies uh, to have kept you waiting. High Representative Federica Mogherini, together with President Juncker, just met the U.S. Secretary of uh, State. Uh, the High Rep and uh, John Kerry are here now to make short statements to debrief you of the outcome of the meeting. High Representative, you have the floor. Thank you very much, John. It's a pleasure to welcome you in Brussels uh, in uh, times that are uh, difficult. Uh, as uh, uh, we all know, for all of us, uh, first of all for the British people, but also for the Europeans and for our partners. It is extremely important uh, for us Europeans, all of us, uh, your visit here uh, in Brussels today, as uh, we discussed today, uh, our partnership stays strong and crucial, not only for the benefit of our people, but also for uh, peace and security in the world. And uh, this was uh, uh, an excellent opportunity for us to discuss uh, the current situation, the way forward. I will not enter into details in that respect, but especially uh, to uh, reaffirm the strength of our partnership, the strength of the European Union role with partners around the world, and the continuation of our common work, uh, first of all, in our region. Uh, we work together, as you know, uh, very closely on the quartet for the Middle East. Uh, we had a chance of uh, exchanging views uh, on uh, the quartet reports that we're finalizing. We're working together on uh, Syria and the International Support Group. We work together on Libya and on so many other issues. And we will meet again twice in the coming weeks, obviously at the NATO summit. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union. 62% of voters cast their votes to remain in the EU. Every single local government area in the country voted to remain in the EU. And in Scotland, we voted to remain because it really matters that we are in the single European market, because we value the free movement of people, of goods and services, because our EU citizenship rights matter, as do our legal safeguards for workers, for women and for parents. In Scotland, Mr Speaker, we voted to remain because we are a European nation. to us that we live in an outward-looking country, not a diminished Little Britain. Yeah. In Scotland, we are now being told from Westminster that despite the majority against leave, we're going to have to do as we're told. We're going to be taken out of Europe against our will. Mr Speaker, let me tell this House and our friends across Europe, we have no intention whatsoever of seeing Scotland taken out of Europe. Yeah.
share prices are so volatile that some stocks have temporarily been suspended and sterling has hit a 31-year low. Mr. Speaker, on one thing I hope we are all agreed, and that is that we take very serious note of the very disturbing series of racist incidents directed against our fellow citizens who happen to come from other European countries. I hope that we all, on all sides, totally repudiate these despicable acts and encourage the police and prosecuting authorities to do all that they can. Mr. Speaker, given the economic damage and uncertainty that is currently being caused, may I ask the Prime Minister the following financial questions? We welcome the actions of the Governor of the Bank of England to help provide certainty in difficult times. Can the Prime Minister confirm that the Governor has no plans presently to change his forward guidance on interest rates? The SNP will continue to support any sensible measures to deliver stability and confidence in the UK economy at this time. However, we want to be explicitly clear that this will not be used to further deepen the programme of austerity. In conclusion, Mr Speaker, the lack of leadership from Whitehall over the past few days has been unprecedented. We recognise that any further drift or vacuum simply exacerbates uncertainty. We know the Prime Minister is planning to leave, and we wish him well, but can we have an absolute assurance that his government will finally start to take a firm grip of the situation we all sadly find ourselves in? First of all, what I say to the right honourable gentleman is our focus should be to get the very best deal for the United Kingdom outside the European Union, and that should be the very best deal for Scotland as well. Um, I absolutely agree with him about the despicable acts of racism that have taken place, and let me reassure him as well that we'll take every step that we can. He asked questions specifically about interest rates. That is a matter for the Government of the Bank of England and the Monetary Policy Committee, and they set out their views in advance of the referendum. He asked about budgets. That's going to be a matter for a future government. But let me say this to him. Scotland benefits from being in two single markets, the United Kingdom and the European single market. In my view, the best outcome is to try and keep Scotland in both. Sir William Cash. States at the European Council tomorrow, namely that the voters of the United Kingdom have demonstrated that the value of that great principle, the principle of democracy, for which people fought and died. Well, let me thank my honourable friend. Of course, when I go to the European Council tomorrow, I will report directly on the result and the decision of the British people. Uh, and no one should be in any doubt about that. But I think it's important that we set off on this path of exiting from the European Union with trying to build as much goodwill as possible. Now, you're quite, uh, you're quite right, Mr. Schultz. UKIP used to protest against the establishment, and now the establishment protests against UKIP. So something has happened here. Let us listen to some simple, pragmatic economics. We, between us, between your countries and my country, we do an enormous amount of business in goods and services. That trade is mutually beneficial to both of us. That trade matters. If you were to decide to cut off your noses, to spite your faces, and to reject any idea of a sensible trade deal, the consequences would be far worse for you than it would be for us. And I, even, even no deal is better for the United Kingdom than the current rotten deal that we've got. But if we were to move to a position where tariffs were reintroduced on products like motor cars, then hundreds of thousands of German workers would risk losing their jobs. So why don't we just be pragmatic, sensible, grown up, realistic, and let's cut between us Let's cut between us a sensible tariff-free deal and thereafter, and thereafter, recognise, 
that the United Kingdom will be your friend, that we will trade with you, we will cooperate with you, we will be your best friends in the world. But do that, do it sensibly and allow us to go off and pursue our global ambitions and future. Thank you. It's rallying strongly this morning. It is now 12% up since its February lows. Sterling is weak, but then it started declining from July 2014. And the Prime Ministers of Australia and New Zealand are now vying for who can be the first country from outside the EU to do a trade deal with the United Kingdom. Things are looking pretty good. The only upheaval is political upheaval, where we've seen a Prime Minister resign and indeed the British Commissioner Lord Hill resign. They've both done so, I think, for the right reasons. You never know, we may be getting rid of a Labour Party leader as well. But upheavals in politics can actually be a very healthy and a very good thing. Uh, and I got into politics because our political class in Britain led us towards a European political project. So if that result last week sweeps a few of them away, so be it. But I am looking forward next year to celebrating our Independence Day on June the 23rd.